Today's webinar is entitled Valentine's Day Wine and Food Pairings, What Makes Some More Attractive Than Others. Our presenter today is Lorraine Hems, RIT Class of 11, and a lecturer in the Department of Hospitality and Tourism Management and certified sommelier with the Court of Master Sommelier. Before graduating with her BS in social work from Nazareth, Co Nazareth College, she started managing, managing a liquor store, which led to a lifelong passion for the wine and spirits industry. She's worked in retail, wholesale, and education for over 30 years now. Lorraine started teaching part-time in the RIT's Department of Hospitality and Tourism Management in 2001 and began to expand the course offerings and became a full-time lecturer of beverage courses in 2005. Her many contributions to RIT events and the local community were recognized in 2006 when she was awarded the department's Special Service Award. Before the New York Wine and Color Culinary Center in Canandaigua, New York opened in 2006, Lorraine was involved in hiring and training staff and creating programs. She continues to teach there and is involved with classes for Wegmans employees, industry, and the public. She teaches wine and spirit education trust courses at RIT, the New York Wine and Culinary Center, and Constellation Brands, and is working with, on her WSET diploma. She has participated in grant work through RIT and was able to bring a group of students to the RIT campus in Dubrovnik, Croatia, and Abruzzo, Italy in 2013. She has authored a textbook Passport to the Wines of the World that she uses in her Wines of the World One course, and, com and she completed her MS in Service Leadership and Innovation at RIT in 2011. Lorraine's industry certifications include being a certified sommelier with the Court of Master Sommelier, a certified wine educator, and certified specialist of spirits through the Society of Wine Educators a certified Bordeaux educator, and a certified wine judge through the American Wine Society. She co-founded a local chapter of Women for Wine Sense with an RIT alumna, Deborah Myberg, in 1999, and was recognized nationally with the Women for Wine Sense Lifetime Achievement Award in 2012. Lorraine enjoys various roles with Women for Wine Sense and the American Wine Society that have included volunteering, presenting and teaching at local events and national conferences. In her free time, she enjoys checking different wine regions off her spit bucket list by traveling, presenting, and judging at wine and spirits competitions in both hemispheres. She also enjoys keeping in touch with former students and serves as a source for radio, newspapers, magazines, books, and the trade. Lorraine, let's get started. Wow, thanks, Katie. Um, uh, I, I thank you for that lovely introduction, of course, I think, and Truth in Advertising, I wrote it. So that was a little too long, but we'll get started. I want everyone to feel very comfortable and, and casual and, and hopefully have a lot of fun with this today because that's been my approach uh, from the very beginning. Before I even got started here at RIT, um, as Katie mentioned, I have my degree in social work from Nazareth, but before I graduated from there, I started working in a small liquor store. And at the time they hired me, uh, much to my amazement looking back, I didn't drink. So um, if I'm working in a store from 12 to 9 every day, about the last thing in the world I knew anything about was wine, and then wine and food pairing was way beyond that. Uh, unless somebody wanted to know what might pair with Rice Krispies, uh, that was when I'd be home and uh, wasn't drinking wine in the morning, though. So a lot of this came from trial error, uh, attending a lot of seminars and conferences, and then just a lot of it is common sense. So I'm going to start out with some of the things that are basic for our wine and food pairings and then also wind up talking specifically about dessert pairings and what makes maybe our Valentine's Day wine and food pairings more attractive. So I'd like to cover some basics of wine and food pairing with the first few slides. And then let's understand what's different about dessert pairings. There's something very different and um, can be a little bit of a trip up for people because of the sweetness of the desserts usually. So that's something to examine and then uh, go over ways that you can be successful at it. And then implement these suggestions for tasty Valentine's Day pairings. Uh, we 
originally talked about dates and I said, let's aim for this one right before Valentine's Day and give you lots of good tips. So I've got a lot of information on these slides that uh, we'll talk briefly about and then really focus on the dessert wine slides. There's our picture of our busy campus today with everything going on and then into pairing basics. It's much easier to make your food match your wine than it is to make your wine match your food. The wine is already bottled. So whether it has a screw cap, a synthetic cork, a, a real cork made from oak bark in Portugal, whatever that, or maybe it's a bag in the box with a nice tap on the front of it, it's a finished product. That wine is done and as a result, we really can't change that wine. But we can do different things to tweak the different dishes that we're preparing, thinking about even sides with those dishes that are going to impact the wine. So there's lots of ways we can uh, make those wine pairings stronger, but it's much easier to make your food match the wine than it is the reverse. One of the first things we need to think about with wine uh, in general is the fact that it's agricultural. For me, starting out from a point of view that I didn't drink wine, for me, wine came from a shelf in a store. But that's not really what we're talking about with wine. Wine is an agricultural product because it started out in a vineyard. It started out with roots in the ground, the vines bringing all of these flavors and components to those grapes, and then using those grapes to turn into these fabulous wines. So understanding where those grapes came from, understanding those regions can really help us with our wine and food pairings. In particular, cooler climate or a region that has less sun or a, a region that has less sun that particular year is going to find that they're more, um, more often able to grow good green grapes. Those grapes can get very ripe in those conditions where it's a cooler climate making great wines. You'll find delicate, fresher aromas and flavors, lighter bodied wines that can be very refreshing, higher acid. And higher acid is something that we don't think about probably when we're having a glass of wine, but it's something that's very important for the pairing. Because a wine that's higher in acid is going to be a wine that is very mouth-watering. And so every bite of food that you take is going to have this ability to clean up after every sip of wine, after every bite of food, if that wine is higher acid. Um, higher acid wines, we find that more often in these cooler climates because as a grape is ripening on the vine, increasing in sugar content, if we have a cooler climate where the grapes don't get quite as ripe, that grape is naturally much higher in acid but lower in sugar. With that lower sugar content, we don't have as much to convert into alcohol, so we tend to see lower alcohol wines which also contribute to more refreshing, lighter bodied style wines. If we switch into a warmer climate or a particular region that has a very good uh, amount of sun that particular year, those climates are better for black or red grapes and red wines. Those warmer climates might not be as good for white wines because you might be baking out under that hot sun the more delicate flavors of a grape, but great for red grapes. Great for red grapes that we have thicker skins that we need to get that sun going to develop all the flavors and ripen those grapes. Uh, as a result, warmer climate wines tend to be much bolder, richer aromas and flavors. So full bodied, because now we've got the ability to ripen those grapes, higher sugar content that can, can be converted to higher alcohol. That higher alcohol adds weight, adds uh, a little bit more length maybe to the finish of that wine, but we have to be very careful to watch our acidity levels in those grapes out in those types of climates because as that sugar increases in the grape, the acidity starts to drop. Um, I like to tell my students that the grapes in those warmer climates are dropping acid in the vineyard, but I'm not sure that's appropriate for today. So anyway, um, moving into our next uh, slide, what this is really brought from a book that I've used in wine and food pairing classes, and I see some names of former students that have taken this class that are joining us today. And Andrea Immer Robinson has been noted throughout the wine world as being one of the most accessible, one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet that can provide great information about wines and wine and food pairings. And this is her idea that we should fit our wine to our food. And FIT, this is what these break down to, flavor, intensity, texture. 
flavor, our tongue tastes basically three components in wine, and that's it. So we only talk about sweet, sour, bitter. But you don't see anyone going into a store saying, I want a wine that tastes like 30% uh, sour, 30% bitter, and 40% sweet. They, we don't talk that way. So what we're looking for really are things that we smell. We have to get our nose involved to be able to smell wines to actually be able to taste them. And our nose is doing about 90 to 95% of our actual tasting for us. So that's why we hear about white wines with pear and apple and pineapple and red wines with cherry and chocolate and all of these other components that really come out of our ability to smell, not what we're actually physically tasting on our tongue. So let's let go of some of that tongue and then move on to similarities. Can we pair similar flavors in a dish with our wine? If this wine has a lot of tropical flavors, could I pair it with a fish with a mango salsa? So thinking about some similar flavors as we're fitting our wine with our food. Intensity is very important. We don't want to overwhelm our wine or serve something that's too light to match up to that dish and wine. So we're going to match intensity so that the wine or food is not overpowered. We're going to consider food preparation as well. And one of the things I do in my class, uh, we'll have one week poached salmon, so something that has only been cooked slowly in a lower temperature in maybe a light broth or water. So not imparting a lot of flavor into that salmon. And then a few weeks later having grilled salmon. The texture is different. The aromas and flavors are different. And so our wine will change with the intensity of that dish or something might become overwhelmed. Oak aging for a wine can make that wine more complex and also intense, a concentration. Just like the difference between our poaching and grilling for food, our oak can concentrate and intensify a wine. Finally, texture. Texture, we could pair a crisp white wine with lots of good acidity with a creamy dish and that acidity cuts like a knife through that richness. Or we could pair a creamy wine to match that texture as the creamier food, maybe an Alfredo sauce is something that we're consuming that evening. So you can compare and contrast with our textures and fit your wine with your food. Let's look at foundation flavors of wine. We have acidity, fruit, oak. These are the basis of making our wine fit, hopefully, with our food. Acidity in wine will amplify flavors in food. So it'll make it brighter, it'll make it jump in your mouth, and you'll taste more. Uh, sometimes we add salt to a dish to make that flavor impact intensify. Same with acidity. So almost thinking about a squeeze of lemon on a fish fry, that changes how uh, bright it is, those flavors are in our mouth. Cooler climates will have that higher acidity, so acidity in our mouth, like that stronger lemon would make our mouth water, and the saliva brings the pH in our mouth back into balance. So we're ready for another bite of food and another sip of wine. It's a horrible, vicious cycle. So acidity in a wine, you will see on the back labels of wine, crisp, zingy, tart, tangy, sharp, refreshing, bright, all of those things that would lead us to think that this wine might be good with other foods that might be creamy or have those crisp characteristics. If we look at another basic uh, um, way to evaluate our wines, fruit. You can have a fruity wine without it being sweet, but here we're talking about fruit as in lower amounts, lower intensity than actually maybe picking up an apple and biting into it. In wine, we see it in smaller intensities. But what we'll find with white wines like Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, these, when they're planted in cooler climates, tend to have on this fruit continuum, apple, pear, kiwi, moving along more moderate climates, even into warmer climates, finishing up with pineapple and dried fruits. So going from very crisp into more tropical, exotic flavors. With our red wines, like Pinot Noir, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, cooler climates, cranberry, tartness, red cherry, and then moving into warmer climates, lush, raspberry, plum, all the way into, again, our dried fruit, blackberry. So acidity, fruit, and finally oak. And as I mentioned before, oak 
can intensify. So aging a wine in oak, fermenting a wine in oak, or if maybe those barrels are too expensive and you don't have enough space to store your barrels and keep them going, then maybe we can do these alternative oak products that are out there now, oak staves, oak chips. All of those oak products can create flavors in wine that don't come from the grape itself. So the descriptors you'd see for a wine that might have been fermented or aged in oak could include dessert flavors, toasty, nutty, coconut, caramel. Those are things that you won't find with an unoaked wine, but those are components that'll come out as that wine has been aged in oak. So what are our foundation flavors of food? Sweetness, meatiness, fattiness. Sweetness doesn't automatically mean sweetness from sugar. Sweetness can refer to peak fresh flavors. When you hear about people doing local foods and what's in season, now we're talking about peak fresh fruits and vegetables. Younger wines, wines that have just been released maybe in the spring from a certain wine region are going to be much more peak fresh and be much more fruit uh, forward. You can really pick up that fruit much more easily. We tend to also talk about new world wines, any wine that has been made at a winery outside of Europe, outside of Western Asia, where those vines originally were, um, where we first saw those vines planted. Then we saw them going out through the rest of the world. New world will be anywhere outside of those original areas. Those wines tend to be bigger and bolder with more in your face fruit. New world wines are the ones we tend to sit down with at home and just drink on their own. Old world wines, tend to be more earthy, almost reflect more a sense of where those vines were planted. Those tend to be wines that are always intended to go with food. So a lot of it's like a California, a glass of California wine on its own, and that fruit is much more obvious. It's not as sneaky and layered and difficult to describe as maybe something from the old world. So peak, fresh, sweetness. Meatiness, on the other hand, having been vegetarian a few times in my life, uh, meatiness doesn't have to mean a protein that originally had a face or a parent. Uh, meatiness can mean meatier flavors you might find from something like a grilled portobello mushroom. I think you could probably smell that right now and, and get that intensity and almost treating it like a burger between a couple buns. That meatiness comes out again without it being something like uh, chicken, beef, etc. Many old world European wines are earthier and meatier. They're produced with the idea that they always go with food. We're always going to try and enhance that food experience. That's what old world wines are aiming for. So they tend to go really well with meatier foods. Fattiness doesn't automatically mean a fatty cut of beef. Fattiness can mean something richer, fattier like avocado, or when you take mayonnaise and spread that on the bread, or an aioli that you would have at your meal. Those fattier foods, that will uh, coat your tongue and definitely affect how we perceive the wine. Higher acid wines from cooler climates help cut through that fattiness, but also many old world wines tend to have that higher, acid, uh, higher acidity built right in there to help with that pairing. Let's focus now on pairing desserts with dessert wines. We got our basics. We understand the foundation flavors of wine, foundation flavors of food. I don't know how many of you are gonna have nice a, create a savory meal and several courses for Valentine's Day, but dessert wines, that's where we have problems with attractions and figuring out what might work. So you're gonna be the matchmakers. You're gonna be pairing now. No steadfast rules. First and foremost, I said fun, casual today. Don't worry, there is no perfect wine for everybody. There's no perfect wine every single time. Wines are ever-changing, ever-breathing. So one wine that might work one time might not be as good appearing the next time, and it isn't because you failed. It just could be the setting or that wine has changed, a new year, a new vintage. But it is important to choose a wine as often as possible. Choose a wine that is, sweet, is as sweet as, if not sweeter than the food. And that's where we're gonna go from here because it is so much easier. If you um, have a sweeter food, a sweeter dessert, and then try it with a drier wine, it'll strip that wine of its fruit and make it taste a lot drier, almost to the point of tasting bitter. Just totally out of balance, not the true character of that wine. 
So um, in Australia, they, ha they make a lot of dessert wines, and their nickname for those are stickies, because as you're pouring a sweet wine, that uh, wine might drip down the edge of that bottle, and your hand becomes sticky while you're holding it. So a uh, little pun here, but stick with a sweet wine, and you can't go wrong with your dessert pairing. There are four basic categories of dessert wine. And how Andrea Emmer Robinson categorized them from the beginning was, according to the factor that makes them sweet. Well, things in the wine world do change, and so I've included a couple other things at the end here, but category one, late harvest, then frozen grape, dried grape, fortified wine. And then the others that we'll talk about at the end, fruit wines. There's some great fruit wines around the world, but not um, considered maybe as noble or as wonderful as many of these other grape wines that we're familiar with. So fruits other than grapes, uh, chocolate wines are becoming quite popular. And then even wine-based cream type wines. So we'll talk about those a little bit later. Late harvest wines, this category is referring to grapes that are left to hang longer on the vine, hang out in the vineyard a little longer to get riper and sweeter. Uh, waiting, until be, uh, waiting to be picked until we've had the right conditions. Hopefully we haven't had a lot of rain at this point. We're using up that sun, that Indian summer late burst of heat. And this can take place all over the world. Um, it's not limited to one region. There aren't always a lot of laws governing this. So let that grape hang out there on the vine. You are certainly taking more risks though with this category. And that's why you see them increase in price. It's a choice. I have a sure crop of these wines, of these grapes, or I'll let it hang out a little bit longer to create something a little more special. But less is usually produced because our grapes are shriveling up. They're losing moisture and turning to raisins on the vine. But that's creating more concentrated, rich nectar available for that bottling. Um, also, within late harvest, you could have some grapes that are attacked by something called noble rot. I'm, I'm not sure this necessarily attractive, but the Latin term for this favorable mold is called botrytis. And you need certain conditions, humidity, um, followed by a lot of heat during the day. So you usually see this happening later in the season. If you're located near a lake, like the Finger Lakes or a river, you will see this occurring. And that noble rot might not happen every year, everywhere, but it can be quite favorable. And then you'll see those grapes, again, lose moisture, shrivel up, Flavors become much more concentrated. This also produces glycerol, which gives so much more weight and a syrupy thick texture, honey flavor to your wine. So you usually can smell it right away in the nose, this honey that's created by the botrytis affecting those grapes. Late harvest common grapes for this process, uh, usually Riesling, uh, that around the world, uh, Muscat as well, different families of Muscat, different types of those. Semillon, probably most famous uh, in the creation of a wine called Sauterne from the Bordeaux region in France. Chenin Blanc in the upper uh, sections of France and also in South Africa. And then in cooler climates, the US and Canada, there's a French-American hybrid. So it's a hybrid grape uh, developed and it is something that is usually less expensive to deal with than something like these others or Riesling and also is a little higher yielding. And the, and the flavors can be incredible, like, like drinking creme brulee or uh, caramel. It can be a wonderful flavor. But those are most common grapes. These are the types of wines that go very well with fruit desserts because they taste like fruit. They'll taste like apricot and uh, mango. And then compare with also rich foods like foie gras. Classic pairing would be that French semillon, that saw turn with something like foie gras, even during the meal, because these have intensity of flavor. Yes, they're sweet, but they also have alcohol and uh, very often great acidity to balance all of that sweetness. Our frozen grapes, it depends on where in the world you're going to be talking about this category, because true traditional uh, Ice wines happened by accident, that the grapes froze and no one was quite sure what to do with it. And you see a lot of history in Germany documenting and going through the process of perfecting this ice wine production. But a grape that was frozen on the vine, 
usually in climates that are cooler every year, consistently quite cool every year. And so the most northern major wine producing country like Germany sees these colder conditions every year. We see it very often in the Finger Lakes. Ice wines are made in those types of climates when the grapes are left to freeze on the vine. Not just the first frost, hard frost, up and down, and so you'll see grapes being picked maybe as late as December or into the next year, January, even February. But they're picked and pressed while frozen. People will go out um, early morning, three in the morning, it's dark still, picking these because they need to follow these traditions of picking while frozen and then pressing those grapes while frozen. When they press it, they're pulling out these ice crystals and only taking that remaining, literally it can be a drop of nectar from each of those grapes. This allows the character of the grapes to shine through. You can see a lot of grape characteristics from that, but you can imagine not a lot of it is produced. We don't get a lot of uh, grape juice to really deal with. Canada is the largest producer very consistently everywhere, uh, especially in, uh, right across the border here from uh, Rochester area and Niagara Peninsula, but Germany has the ice vine history. Well, in areas that don't get cold or in areas where uh, maybe you don't want to send people out into the vineyard in the middle of the night, maybe you don't want to get up on Christmas Day and go pick frozen grapes, you have other things to do. There are other ways to create a, an ice wine-like wine. So true ice wine versus faux or an iced wine, true ice wines will stick to those traditions, exact temperature ranges from when the grapes can be picked, following that, uh, that tradition. Now, faux or ice wines can take liberties not allowed in some countries. In Germany, you can't do this faux process and maybe just take regular grapes, uh, regular grape harvest, freeze them and press them while frozen later. That wouldn't be traditional. So a true ice wine follows all those steps. A fake iced wine would maybe regular or late harvest grapes, pick them, freeze them in a facility, maybe not even on their property, and then press later on. And maybe after the craziness of harvest has taken place. And also you could take a finished wine and spin out that water, and now we have an ice wine-like dessert wine. So a couple different processes, one traditional, one, hey, we got the technology, we can do it the way we want to. So whatever the local laws are, that's what you'll probably go with. These frozen grape wines, these ice wines are always sweet. When in doubt, these go with almost anything sweet as far as a dessert pairing. Dry grapes. This is uh, very much old world based where they would go out, pick grape clusters, then maybe dry them out under the sun on straw mats. Or maybe they'd hang the clusters up in attics, in the ventilated attics. Maybe they would, uh, stack these great uh, clusters and racks inside a winery to dry out. So whatever it might be, you're going to have several different ways you can just dry those grape clusters out. And it has to be under controlled conditions. You don't want them to just dry out too much. You want to make sure the humidity doesn't allow it to become moldy. So dry conditions. And those wines will have flavors of dried fruits, apricots, raisins, dates, figs. Examples, probably most famous, Vin Santo from Tuscany, Italy. And that particular dessert wine uh, you might see at the end of a meal. And it's not quite as crazy sweet as some other dessert wines that we would usually see in the U.S. And it might go well with something like a biscotti, nice, dry, and nutty. There's also another example, Amarone, which some of you might be familiar with as sort of a dry red from Northeast Italy on steroids. But this one, the Amarone, you can have the dry styles, you can also have a sweeter style that would go well with desserts. So a wide variety of styles that you would see with dried grapes, many of these can pair with savory foods and others will be better with nutty, baked goods, biscotti, cookies. Uh, with any of these dessert wines, you're really talking about using uh, about two ounces you wouldn't want a larger serving than that because they can be intense alcohol, they could be intense sweetness. And speaking of alcohol, here we are, fortified wines. Our fortified wines are fortified by 
higher alcohol. Strengthened was usually a neutral grape brandy, dropping it in either during or after fermentation, and it really strengthens it. Uh, this is a category that really was created many, many years ago when people were transporting wines around the globe. And you didn't have perfect storage conditions, but fortification would really help maintain the quality of the wine. So some of the early wines into the U.S. from the U.K. or Portugal, those fortified wines made them a little bit more seaworthy. So a fortified wine strengthened with neutral grape brandy, maybe somebody uh, New World would use something like a vodka. But we're talking about unaged grape brandies, and they're very, very high proof. If you drop that high alcohol into a ferment fermentation, it's going to kill off that yeast. Yeast says, that's it, I'm done, I'm not going to work in a hostile environment. And that residual sugar is left behind. The sugar that wasn't fermented out, those are always sweet. The perfect example of that is a port from Portugal. Now, you could fortify a wine after fermentation when it's, been for, when it's been fermented to full dryness. And a perfect example would be a sherry from Spain. But sherries can run dry to sweet. And the sweetness could come if something was added to sweeten it later, after the fermentation, after the fortification. So you can find dry sherries and even sweet sherries and everything in between. Another example would be something called Madeira, which I love, especially this time of year. Those can run dry to sweet of a wide variety of, of styles and uh, desserts that you could pair them with. But these fortified wines definitely have higher alcohol than a regular table wine, usually closer to about, oh, say, 15 to 21 percent alcohol. Most of the table wines are going to be below that number. If you're unsure, how sweet a dessert might be. Somebody's invited you to their house. They say, well, sure, bring a dessert wine if you'd like uh, to go with their dessert. Well, port richness is usually a good bet to be sweeter than any dessert. If you don't know how sweet the dessert is, it makes it difficult for the pairing. But port goes with everything. And in particular, I love it with chocolate desserts, which we'll talk about a little bit more right now. Other dessert wines, other than those four main categories, we're looking at wineries and fruit growing regions. Uh, we have an alum out at a winery called Montezuma uh, near Auburn, New York, and right near Cayuga Lake. And they're famous for their cranberry bog wine. And I serve it in class. You could have this cranberry dessert wine with cheesecake, and it is almost like putting the fruit topping right on that plain cheesecake. It's delicious. So there are many fruit wines. Um, but you need those fruit orchards usually near those wineries to create these great fruit wines. Not around the world, uh, so you don't see them mentioned in the same breath as these other four categories, but they can be quite delicious. And I mentioned pineapple wine. Uh, when I was in Hawaii, I had a great pineapple wine, and uh, if I could get it again locally, I think I would serve more of that with desserts as well. Chocolate added to wine. Well, one of the ways this came about was there was a lot of extra French, cho French wine sitting around, red French wine that wasn't selling, and somebody thought, let's put some Dutch chocolate with this, and now there's a whole new category of chocolate wines, and I can tell you a lot of my students love this. So another category, wine-based cream beverages. There's a uh, product out there called Moo, M-U, that's uh, produced by Ledestri. And uh, locally, we find a lot of this with different flavors, and you can get cappuccino, you can get chocolate. And a lot of these wine-based cream beverages work well with desserts as well. So a basic, a uh, little bit of a cheat for you to, if I'm going to have chocolate or nuts or fruit desserts, you could use this to help you with the pairings. Complementary flavors and textures. Chocolate is very difficult to pair with wine. I've been asked to do a lot of wine and chocolate pairings, and to be honest, I don't like to do it because uh, they, they aren't always successful. I guarantee you, if you're a person that likes chocolate and you like wine, you're probably going to like chocolate and wine together. But it can be difficult depending on what kind of cocoa content you're talking about with your chocolate. So with chocolate, choose a wine that might have more berries, orange, caramel, and nutty flavors. The darker the chocolate, the higher the cocoa content, the darker the wine. So I have seen successfully a dark Cabernet Sauvignon, rich, 
with a little bit of tannin, a little bit of bitterness to it. And that bitterness can be really good with a more bitter, higher cocoa content chocolate. Um, if you put bitter and bitter together, they actually mellow in your, wine, in your brain. There, there's this fabulous two positives make almost a negative. Same with acidity with acidic dishes. Same with sweet and sweet. If a dessert wine tastes too sweet to you on, your, on its own, pair it with a sweet dessert and they seem to mellow each other out. So a little darker wine with higher cocoa content chocolate. Nuts, plenty of nutty wines, especially our dried uh, grape wines work well with caramel and dried fruit desserts. Fruity, uh, fruity wines, uh, fruits uh, with your desserts, a lot of the late harvest ice wines work here. Creamy, honey, creme brulee, custards go well with a lot of fruit wines. And then finally cookies, you could go out to the store. Uh, one of my favorite examples recently, I had a snickerdoodle cookie with a Madeira uh, that was a Boal, B-U-A-L. And somehow all of the spices and the sweetness, it was one of the best pairings I'd had recently and it was good and inexpensive. So it was fun. Tips. The more pronounced a wine is, the harder it is to match with a wider variety of foods. So matching our intensities. If a wine is really big and bold, pair it with something big and bold. It might be later in your meal. You might start out with something a little bit lighter, your salad, your soup courses, and then build, and it's the same with our wine. So more pronounced wines pair with bolder flavors. Color association. I think if you just take it very basically, a white wine can go with chicken, turkey, those white meats, pork. And then we kind of have a crossover area where I love rosés, I think, with, with things that are lighter colored. So maybe rosé with roasted turkey, with uh, fish, salmon, and then even going into lighter meats, lighter red meats. Uh, Pinot Noir is my crossover grape. It's a little bit lighter in color than some other red wines. It will go well with turkey, chicken, salmon, light red meats, veal, and then uh, Riesling. Riesling goes with almost everything. When I was in Germany, they served it throughout the meal because Riesling has great acidity in these cooler climates and they can run dry to sweet, so you can have a lot of fun with Riesling. And sparkling wines, use more sparkling wines. Those scrubbing bubbles help clean up after every sip and a lot of the sparkling wines come from cooler climates where the acidity is higher. So good wine and food pairing. No coffee. This is my one rule. Don't serve coffee with your wine and dessert. It will kill the wine. Serve the coffee separately, serve your dessert separately, but if you're doing wine and dessert together, don't have coffee at the same time. That bitterness can really throw off that pairing. Again, no perfect wine for everyone, so relax. Take it easy, don't worry. And then, and then most importantly, personal preference. I've had students say to me, but I don't like this pairing, and what don't you like about it? Well, I, I don't like nuts. Well, then you're not gonna like that pairing. So don't beat yourself up, just relax, enjoy what you're pairing together. If it's your favorite, it's your favorite. Don't worry what anyone else tells you. Questions? Um, now, does anyone have any questions? I do have a couple here that we can start with um, from Matt. Can you talk about the aging process? Sure. I think when you're looking at aging wines, the majority of wines now, and I mean majority, uh, white wines we usually want to consume within the first year or two, especially comes in a clear bottle. That clear bottle is screaming at you, drink me now, we'll make more. So don't hold on to those white wines. There seems to be so much mystery and, and uh, I don't know, sort of a reverence given to a wine if, if they say it can age well. But most winemakers understand their wines, they need to move them along. So white wines, first couple of years. Red wines, now they're really advancing some of the, the processes and, and production. A lot of red wine is meant to be consumed quickly. We're a mobile society now. So we're not forming cellars and living in the same house generation after generation. I'm buying a bottle of wine. I'm usually consuming it within a few days. So I don't need that wine to age a long time. Red wines, maybe two to five years 
at most. And if most of our wines that we're buying seem to be oh, 10 to $15 or so, those are the wines we're not meant to age. Don't worry about aging. Uh, if you're worried about aging, check with your store and see what wines they might recommend. Otherwise, drink sooner than later. Okay, now we have a question from Carol. Do bag-in-a-box package wines taste different from most glass bottles wines? I've tried doing some uh, comparisons, but sometimes bag-in-the-box facilities will be separate from where they're bottling. So there can be a little variation, but in general, box wines have been a whole new category, uh, at least for us here in the U.S., that you can get great wines. Um, I think we tend to think of them as lower quality, and we've, we've certainly seen the larger five-liter bag in the box. Bag in the box started in Australia and was popular decades ago. So it's not something really that new, and the beauty of a bag in the box certainly is it's much more transportable, it's not as heavy, you get more bang for the buck in that bag in the box, and it stays fresher longer. So it's not taking as much space, and the quality is there. You see a lot of three liter bag in the box from all over the world now coming in. I would say overall, not a big difference between the glass, and enjoy them, they're, they're, they're fun. Now we have a question from Walter. What wine should I pair with spicy oriental foods? Oh my gosh, thank you, Walter. I love heat and spice. I love Mexican foods, I love Thai foods, and I like things with a lot of peppers in them. And I'm not as much of a beer fan. So what I like with uh, spicy oriental foods, I, I prefer sparkling wines, maybe with a little bit of sweetness. I love Riesling. Uh, I have Rieslings in my refrigerator all the time, especially ones with a little bit of sweetness, and we see a lot of great ones here in the Finger Lakes, or uh, good, inexpensive. You know, you don't, you don't want something that's going to be very fine quality, over $15 a bottle, because some of that heat will overwhelm that wine. So I'm looking to a little bit of sweetness to offset that heat. And again, acidity, making that, those flavors just pop. Thanks, Lorraine. Now we have a question from Daniel. Do you have any comments on the Virginia wine? Were you in my class yesterday, Daniel? I uh, had somebody mention they were from Virginia yesterday, and Virginia wines are incredibly good. Um, and one of the things we talked about was all 50 states produce wine. They all have wineries. All 50 states have vineyards. But it's very tough to get smaller production wines into the next state. So you don't see a lot of great New York wines outside of New York State. Some of these places will ship, but Virginia, being further south than our Finger Lakes region, you'll see a lot more red wines being produced based on, thanks to Thomas Jefferson, uh, very much the French varieties, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, uh, Syrah. So you'll see a lot of blends. You'll see uh, a grape called Viognier that they do very well down there. Chardonnay is one of their best ones, so great wines out of Virginia. Carol asks, what are your thoughts on chocolate-infused wines? We're seeing more and more brands, uh, different producers of it, and some to me honestly taste just like they've opened up Hershey's syrup and poured it into the bottle, but others have a little bit better uh, balance, I would say. So if you were interested in some of the chocolate wines, I'd go in and ask that store what of the ones they carry sell best. Or ask some of your friends if you had any, because you don't see wine reviews for chocolate wines in the wine magazines. These are uh, fairly new, and I wouldn't say taken as seriously, but that doesn't mean that they aren't good quality. So some of the base uh, products in there can be very, very good. I've had a few that I really enjoy. I certainly wouldn't want to sit uh, through a whole meal and have a big five-ounce glass of it, but um, they can be very good wines. Walter asks, how do you know if a wine needs to be decanted to breathe? There are a lot of people out there that will decant everything. Whites, reds, they just want to see it open up a little bit after being trapped in that genie's bottle for so many months or years. Um, but most wines don't need true decanting. There's two main reasons to decant. One would be to remove sediment in an older wine that may have been stored in a cellar. Um, or a wine that might have been unfined or unfiltered and throwing some 
sediment as it ages, but it's usually a wine that's had some age that we worry about sediment precipitating out. The grape skins and literally the color of that wine and a red wine will start to drop out. That you want to remove the clear wine from the sediment. That's one reason to decant. Another reason to decant is if you're like many people and we want our wine when we want it. And it doesn't matter if the wine reviewer said, don't open this wine before 2020. I want to open it. I'm going to open it now. Well, what we're doing with decanting is opening up that bottle, throwing it into a, a decanter maybe for a couple hours to open up and breathe because we've opened it up before maybe some of its true characteristics have come together that would require longer aging in the bottle. So what we're doing is speeding up that aging process by using a decanter. Most wines, if you're really talking about under that $15 mark, aren't meant to be decanted either way, uh, even if it's older. Um, if you've hung onto a wine that's under $15 for 10 years, chances are it's really not going to taste too good. So don't need to decant it then either. Megan would like to know if uh, can most wines then be used as cooking wine, especially if on the older side? Yes. Um, a lot of people will say, and I've said for years, don't cook with a wine that you can't drink. But I think I have to put a little asterisk in there and say, you know, if your wine um, has lost some of its fruit, if it's lost some of its flavor, you could still use it because you're going to be cooking it. You'd be cooking off some of that. Uh, more subtle flavor anyway. If your wine's turned to vinegar, I wouldn't use it because now maybe you've got vinegar. And whatever you're going to be cooking with, just be aware that you're going to concentrate it, that uh, water is going to be cooking out of it. So if you have a wine that has been, you might find something in a grocery store called cooking wine that's had salt added. If you start to cook that down too much, you're just adding a ton of salt to your dish. So. Cooking wines, uh, you can cook with anything. I just don't tend to use anything too expensive. Court would like to know if you could pick one wine and food pairing for Valentine's Day, what would it be? Court, you're setting me up. Court, you you know you're one of my favorite students of, of all time. And I use one of the things you said in my class years and years ago that um, we had a bruschetta pairing with an Italian red wine, at that time, it's no longer available, unfortunately, the wine was called Foreplay, which I, I just thought there was worth conversation starting. And you said, when the wine and food combined, it was like they were holding hands going down my throat together. I love that. So it's truly a nice pairing. Um, and I would go back to sort of a, um, a, another tip of what grows together goes together. And I didn't come up with that phrase, but if you're having Italian food, have some Italian wine with it. Um, one pairing. That's a toughie. That's a toughie. I haven't decided my menu yet, uh, partly because I don't cook. <laughs> but um, I'll bet there's Riesling. No, I'll bet there's sparkling. I bet there's some sort of sparkling there. Maybe some um, Spanish cava with some um, uh, brie or maybe a New York State sparkling with some of our local cheeses. Probably something to start out the meal that direction. Daniel would like to know what happens to a wine as it ages. That's a, that, that I see also, you're, you're wondering about if my wine class is available online. That's going to be worth almost a full class to answer. Um, I think that uh, many things happen to a wine as they age. If we're talking White wines, they'll gain color because of oxygen getting to it in some way or another. So white wines go from lighter to darker, and they lose fruit. So if the wine isn't very complex to begin with, if it isn't oaky, it might start to lose its flavor over time. And you want to get it before it's lost its flavor, of course. Red wines do the reverse as far as color. They lose color as they age, and um, they can gain more complexity. Uh, we're looking for good acid in our wines to help with the aging process, but all wines eventually will go from whatever color they started out to brown and no flavor. So we definitely want to get there before that wine has become ruined. And I guess that's going to be have, going to have to be my shorter answer. Carol would like to know, are wine aerators effective or are they a gimmick? 
I think the wine aerators that are out right now are, are fun and can accomplish with a single glass or two what you would do with decanting a whole bottle of wine. If you ask me, I'm going to say they're fun because I'm really into gadgets and gimmicks and, and just, you know, experimenting and geeky with these wine things. Um, I see a difference. So if you open up a bottle, pour that wine into the glass, and then through, have another glass or through the aerator, you will see a difference between them. If you ask somebody from Cornell that's done the research on it, the same thing would be accomplished by having that wine probably sit there in the glass for 10 minutes. So do you need an aerator? Probably not. Uh, swirling the wine around would aerate it, but I do think they're fun and they do add a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say romance, but for Valentine's Day, sure, add a little bit of fun into your evening. Daniel asks, do you like any specific wineries in Virginia? Oh, there was one called Kluge that's now owned by Trump. And I think that, I know they've changed the name to Trump Vineyards or Trump Winery, um, but there's honestly a lot of them. I'd have to go back and look at my list. Uh, I think there's one called Grey Ghost. I've been to the Williamsburg Winery and it has great history. Um, and they have a couple blended whites that I really like a lot. Um, I know I'm going to forget some, so I better stop. Okay. Um, Daniel was wondering if your class was available online. Not yet. We've talked about it. I, w I wish even today we could have a little scratch and sniff uh, so that you could uh, have some of the wines down there or we could uh, work off the computer and I could send aromas to you. But some of the, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in the near future we had something available. So we've talked about it, you can do it, it's just difficult the minute you start talking about different states because shipping and availability become an issue. Well, that's all the time we have for questions and answers now. Um, many, many thanks to Lorraine for sharing her expertise in wine with us. Um, additional questions can be emailed to ritalum at rit.edu or tweeted to at rit underscore alumni with the hashtag pound merit webinars and we will direct your questions to Lorraine. Please note that all participants will receive an email from us in the next few days with a link to today's webinar recording. Again, Lorraine, many thanks for being our distinguished speaker today, and thank you, and th a thank you to all our listeners for joining us. Thank you. I um, just want to put a reminder out there that the next installment of Me RIT is on Wednesday, February 25th with Tom Haney. He is a senior lecturer in RIT's Center for Multidisciplinary Studies. Tom will be discussing the history of the harmonica and the blues and why the harmonica became such a force in the blues. 